Doubtless you and the ushers must be wondering how I'm going to start fil filtering your questions to the speakers. I'm, I'm going to use the speaker's, a chairman's prerogative to ask a, a couple of questions myself. Uh, I'm not quite sure to whom to address this one. Um, maybe maybe Zafar Bungash. One of the major centers of revolutionary activity in the occupied territories has been the mosques. Uh, do you see the Intifada as turning into a Muslim movement? Actually, the bulk of the support or the main strength of the Intifada has been provided by the mosques and the Muslims returning to their own roots. Uh, in his talk, Dr. Frankenstein mentioned the presence of the Christian communities as well. I'm aware of it and I do recognize it, as well as uh, the Jewish people. The struggle of the Palestinian people is not against Jewish people or against Christians. It is actually against an ideology called Zionism, which is based on racism, exclusivity, and which stands for the negation of the identity of the Palestinian people. And therefore, after having tried for many years all kinds of options, particularly based on secularism and Arab democracy and Arab front and this and that, all these isms that the people of Palestine tried, they ultimately returned to their roots, which is Islam, their very basis for existence, and it is Islam and the mosques that have now provided the strength and the support for the Palestinian people to continue the intifada against enormous odds. So in that sense, yes, it is Islam and the mosque that is the driving vehicle behind the intifada. Would anybody else like to answer my question? Could you repeat the question? Okay, I'm sorry. Um, one of the major centers of revolutionary activity in the occupied territories has been the mosques. Does this mean that the Intifada is becoming a Muslim movement? Well, I was just over there, and my sense is that the Islamic movement is growing much more rapidly in the Gaza Strip than on the West Bank itself, although there are Islamic fundamentalist inroads in the West Bank, but certainly in Gaza, it's much more evident than on the West Bank. Secular notions of uh, uh, Palestinians in the West Bank are obviously stronger in the West, West Bank than they are in Gaza. One of the great fears, of course, of this Arab-Israeli problem, the, pol the Palestinian-Israeli dimension, let's just take a look at that part of it, is that if there is an increased religious element not just the political element, the struggle between two people for the same piece of territory, but if the religious component gets stronger, in my opinion, it's going to further remove any prospect, as remote as it may be, for some sort of equitable, fair compromise. One of the scariest things that Israelis see when they go out into the West Bank, and I was a witness to it, is when you see the youngsters coming with their pockets with rocks, and ready to throw them. Young kids, what they're shouting, you don't have to understand Arabic to understand what they're saying. They're not saying uh, Hebron, Nablus, Ramallah. What they're clearly saying is Haifa, Jaffa, the Galilee, El Quds. El Quds is Jerusalem. Now, if it is this dimension, the liberation of not just the occupied West Bank and Gaza, but if it is a notion that that is simply a stepping stone for the liberation of the rest of Palestine, then of course this is simply a prescription for total disaster. I was struck by Dr. Finkelstein's courage in advising the Palestinians to intensify the armed struggle or increase the use of force and violence against the Israeli military is really the only way they're going to get their state. And his courage in recommending to the Israelis that they uh, trust the PLO when they say they're ready for a two-state solution. Well, it's easy for him to say that living in Brooklyn, but it's not that easy if you're living in Israel or in the West Bank. Well, 
may I comment? Uh, <laughs> okay. It seems to me that Mr. Blitzer confuses the responsibilities of a scholar and a military commander. As I said at the beginning of my talk, I was giving some sense of where I thought the Intifada was going. And I said the likelihood is there will be an escalation of Palestinian armed resistance and pal an escalation of civil disobedience in the occupied territories. Far be it from me to give that recommendation to the Palesti Palestinians, and surely I wish at least that peace could be achieved otherwise. My understanding of history tells me not likely. On the other hand, as I say, I'm not a military commander by training, and I wasn't giving advice, I was simply giving my sense of where things are going. Let me respond quickly to this question of fundamentalism. In my view, and I suspect I'm going to ha I'll have major disagreements with at least one member of the panel, fundamentalism is a, an ideology basically of despair. The Palestinians, at least at the outset of the Intifada, were united behind a secular resolution of the conflict, namely a two-state settlement. As that possibility recedes, as the likelihood that Israel and the United States will continue in their rejectionism, as that happens, it seems to me the likelihood of a growth or a spread of fundamentalism in Palestine will probably unfold. So for those of us who are concerned about the spread of fundamentalism, it seems to me the obvious alternative is a two-state settlement of the conflict. I would also add a fact that was unfortunately neglected, that one force that was busy, busily promoting fundamentalism in the, uh, in the Gaza was Israel. Until very recently, Israel was working hand in hand with Hamas, the fundamentalist movement in Gaza. In the last couple of months, things have changed somewhat, but for those of you who read the New York Times, you'll notice that none other than Israel's Arab specialist, Clinton Bailey, recently wrote in the op-ed pages of the New York Times, urging Israel to come to a settlement with Hamas, the, Is the Islamic fundamentalists. So it seems to me there is a kind of convergence between Islamic fundamentalism and the state of Israel against a secular resolution of the conflict. One, one of the things that um, when we have these peace table negotiations, and I've always said this, that at peace negotiations I would like to see the clerics present, um, because the theology is very much involved in all their decisions, and I don't think that the, uh, they're going to delve into lots of these problems unless they have their clerics with them. I, I've been to mosques, and I've been to synagogues, I've been to churches. Uh, the clerics have tremendous influence. And so when I speak about, you know, I'm, I'm looking for a secular state. Um, I'm not looking for a, a religious state. So how do we protect that? Um, I would hope that the clerics themselves can address those issues. I face a real Hobson's choice at where I'm, where I'm standing, or a Solomonic decision that has to be made, because we have hundreds of wonderful questions and a limited amount of Zitzfleisch. Uh, so I'll start off with one that's addressed to uh, Dr. Finkelstein, actually two questions that I can combine reasonably well. Um, about, uh, the first questioner asked about the legitimacy of the PLO. The questioner feels that as a terrorist organization, should it be allowed to negotiate with Israel? And the other question is, is the PLO no longer involved in terrorist activities? 